Well, they tell me Brother William Souders used to say, sweet Jesus. And Brother David Dorsey says, sweet. And it is. God has been so good. Uh, and been so good in his life and in yours. And I don't know that we really take the time to appreciate really all that the grace of God has done for us. But grace is so amazing. And, and um, I, I could have been one whose eyes were not open, the song says. I could, not have, been, I could have been one who, who wandered astray. I could have been one. Um, but I'm thankful that the Lord has spoken to my heart. I'm thankful that he spoke to yours and that he brought you this way and gave you a vision of what God's doing. It's so wonderful. You know, sometimes when a pastor rises to speak, some of his messages are exciting and some can even be life-changing and others are more informative and sometimes even more academic. You know, some excite you and lift you up and some strengthen you in the faith. Uh, my mentor, Brother Lloyd Goodwin, used to say that preaching moves the congregation but teaching plants a congregation. And uh, you need both. At times you need to be lifted up and encouraged and, and excited. And uh, there's times that you need something solid that will hold you that it, uh, to have an understanding of your faith and to be able to give a reason for why you believe what you believe and why you use the tools that you use. This is a Bible-believing church. Our faith is built upon a strong foundation. Ephesians 2 and verse 20 says you're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And I tell you, this, this is a, a church that we stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Uh, and I think it's worthwhile to take the time, perhaps, to explain why we use the King James Version. Because it seems that modern Christianity, even Pentecostal and holiness movements, to a large extent are going to other English translations of the Bible. I buy books, Christian books to read, and, and uh, when they quote scriptures, they're quoting some, some new twisted translation that that doesn't say the scriptures the way I understand them to be. It seems that many modern Christians are, have abandoned the King James Version and they may ask you, well, why do you still try to use a 400-year-old version of the Bible? Uh, there's so much more, so many new versions out there. Um, you know, we don't use these and thous and how art thou. Uh, you don't use that kind of language in the common tongue today, but um, I want to explain why we don't accept those modern versions, don't use them very much, maybe occasionally we'll look at them, but as far as teaching and, and uh, learning the Word of God, I, I want to teach and learn from from the King James Version. But I also want to explain why sometimes we will look at what is the underlying Hebrew word or the underlying Greek word because, as you know, the Bible certainly wasn't, wasn't written in English. Jesus didn't speak in English. Peter didn't write his epistles in English. Moses didn't write in English. They wrote in ancient languages. But we teach from the King James English Version, which the authorized version, um, it was first published in 1611, and uh, as I said, it's almost a little over 400 years old, and the English language has changed a lot in four centuries. Uh, the words like conversation don't mean the same thing as they did 400 years ago. When you read the word conversation in the Bible, it doesn't mean talking back and forth. It means, it means uh, lifestyle, manner of living. Uh, chambering doesn't mean what it did some 400 years ago in, a, in the Elizabethan era. That's really, James was the daughter of Elizabeth, or the son of Elizabeth I, not the daughter, the son of Elizabeth I. Um, and some of the more modern 
versions, the Revised Standard Version, the English Standard Version, the, the uh, New International Version, some of these others are a little bit more readable, understandable, because they don't use some of these these and thous and, and uh, that sort of thing. So why don't we join the trend and start using the ESV instead of the KJV, the English Standard Version instead of the King James Version? Like I said, the Bible wasn't written in English. It had to be translated. The original languages had to be translated into English. Most of the great majority of the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew. And then it was, a little bit of it was in Aramaic, parts of the book of Daniel. The entire New Testament was originally written in Greek. By the time of the New Testament church, most of the, it's as evident from the writings particularly of Paul, that when he quoted Old Testament scriptures, he was quoting them not from the original Hebrew, but from a translation into Greek called the Septuagint version. Um, and as far as we know, the original books, the letter that Paul wrote and signed with his own hand, as far as we know, it's no longer in existence. It's probably been worn out through use. But there were copies that were faithfully made and retained through the years. Uh, and I think God promised that he would preserve his inspired word for every generation. There's a scripture in the 12th chapter of the book of Psalms that I rely upon to, to believe that what we have is still valid as God's word. Uh, even though I can't find the original book of, of Deuteronomy or the original scroll of Isaiah, the oldest scroll of Isaiah we have is from 200 B.C., approximately 150 to 200 B.C. in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But I don't have the one that Isaiah actually penned, but I believe that what we have is a faithful copy of what Isaiah wrote. Because here in the 12th chapter of the book of Psalms, verse 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver is tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And I believe that God's truth has been preserved. The word of God has been preserved forever. Jesus said in the 24th chapter of Matthew, uh, Matthew 24, he promised that, uh, that God's word would always be with us. Uh, Matthew 24 and verse 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Uh, the word of God is going to be through all generations. I believe we have a word of God that we can use today. One more verse I'll give you here is the 40th chapter of Isaiah. When the Lord said through his prophet Isaiah in chapter 40 and verse 8, uh, he said, O Zion, oh no, that's verse 8, though grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Uh, I believe those original writings the Hebrew, the Aramaic, and the Greek, those were certainly divinely inspired words of God. The men who, who wrote those, probably about 40 different authors uh, over many generations, over about 1,500 years in uh, different, three different continents, those individuals were inspired of God to write down what they wrote and what we have today. That's why the scripture tells us in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, it tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for, for uh, reproof, for doctrine and reproof and correction and instruction in righteousness. Uh, it is God breathed, that the inspired of God. Uh, when medical personnel talk about breathing, it's inspiration expiration. You inspire, you expire. And what that is telling us is that every verse is God-breathed. 
God breathed these words out. They're powerful words that will lead to salvation. And so what about the King James Version? Is it perfect? Um, Were the scholars who produced that version divinely inspired too? Inspired of God to translate it? Um, Their introduction... I don't know if anybody ever bothers to read the introduction to the King James Version, but when you look at the very beginning of the Bible before the book of Genesis, there is the introduction that the translators wrote to the Most High and Mighty Prince James by the grace of God, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, Defender of the Faith, etc., etc., etc. And when they wrote this, they knew that the truth, I think it's the third paragraph, down toward the, almost to the end of that paragraph, about three or four lines up, it says, the truth has given such a blow to that man of sin as will not be healed. They thought that putting the word of God in the vernacular of the people would actually give such a wound to the man of sin, which they knew to be the Pope of Rome. They said so uh, later in that in that uh, introduction, they said they will be traduced by popish persons, but they thought it would give a wound that would not be healed. They didn't really understand. They weren't perfect theologians. They didn't understand the book of Revelation, the 18th chapter says that, uh, um, not the 18th chapter, let me just turn here and, and read it for you in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation. Uh, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3, and I saw one of the heads of the beast, one of the heads as it were wounded to death. And that's what they thought that Martin Luther, the Reformation, giving the word of God in English would do, would wound that head to the death. But they didn't read the rest of the verse, it said his deadly wound was healed. We're not living in the days of the Protestant Reformation when that wound was delivered. We're living in the days when that wound has been healed. They were wrong on that, that that man of sin is being healed. But in the fourth paragraph of that introduction, and oh, about the middle or second half of it, it said that they were going to, to out of the original sacred tongues, Together with comparing the labor both of our own and of other foreign languages, of many worthy men who went before us, that there should be one more exact translation of the Holy Scriptures under the English tongue. They wanted to have a more exact translation. They tried their best, and I give these men credit. I think it was 56 men who labored on this project I give them credit because they really worked hard. They knew that they were, they were um, not perfect men. They knew they didn't have the perfect understanding, but they did the very best that they could do to give us a more perfect translation of the Bible into English. Now, I don't think it's completely perfect. I wish it was. If it was a completely perfect translation, then we would have to require every Dutchman to learn English, every German to learn English, every Frenchman to learn English, every African, every Indian, every person in every other language in the world would have to learn English in order to know the truth because the only truth would be in the King James Version, and I don't believe that's the case. I just know English, and I've done research on the English translation, and I've concluded, and I'm going to share that conclusion with you, that the King James is the very best English version there is out there. I don't know which is the best German Bible. I don't have any idea which is the best French translation of the original tongues. I couldn't, if you handed me a Chinese Bible, I couldn't read the first word in it or a Hindi Bible. 
I can't tell you which one of those. There's several Hindi different versions of it in those different languages. And I don't know which one is the most accurate because I don't speak those languages. But I do believe that the King James, for reasons I'm going to give you, is the most accurate English translation we have. Those translators looked at the original tongues, the Greek, the Hebrew. They compared those to the works of others who translated before them. And they even looked at translations in other languages to try to produce a more exact translation of the Bible into the English tongue. Now, we don't use the exact translation that they came up with in 1611. They published it. They started in 1604. They published it in 1611. But it's been revised four times uh, in 1629, in 1638, in 1760, and in 1769. And I'll get to those revisions in a minute. But I want to tell you the Word of God truly is truth. And as originally written, it is absolutely infallible. But as translated, it is subject to some errors. Uh, and that's why we have to find the best translation that we can get to minimize any errors. Uh, there have been many translations of the Bible into English over the years, going back to the, about the 10th century. If you can put up that uh, PDF for me, Brother Zachary, I'd appreciate that. Just, I don't know that it'll show very much, but, but there are different, okay, there are some different English translations of the Bible. Back in the 10th century, um, there was a, a Saxon version of the Bible in the 10th century. In the 11th century, there's an old English hexateuch, which was just the first five books of Moses and the book of Joshua. The 11th century, there was an old English Psalter uh, there. Um, then Wycliffe, John Wycliffe translated from the Latin version, from the Latin Vulgate into English, and that's uh, Wycliffe right here. That's the first complete English translation of the Bible in the 14th century. The next three are all works of uh, Tyndale. Uh, he did different parts of the Bible different years, but he was translating originally from the original tongues, from the Hebrew and from the Greek, into English. And uh, it was a better translation. And then after that, in 1535, is the Coverdale Bible uh, by Miles Coverdale. And and uh, it used more modern English. Um, and he used the Latin and the German translations. He got some of the New Testament from Greek. 1537, the, the Matthew, John Rogers, uh, published it. Um, in 1539, the Great Bible was published. And it became the first authorized Bible. That means the King of England said it's appropriate to use in the churches, so it's an authorized version. Um, then in 1560s, the Geneva Bible, original the translation from all the original tongues, it was, uh, that was the Bible that the pilgrims carried to America on the Mayflower. They had the Geneva Bible with them, and they swore by it when they entered into the Mayfair. Uh, Mayflower Compact and started their first colony here. Then the Bishop's Bible in 1568, that was also an authorized Bible, but we got through several revisions. Finally, 1611, here we go, the King James Version, which is now called the Authorized Version because it was authorized. It used the Bishop's Bible as a starting point, but as I said, they went back and revised and, and reviewed the original languages, and, and uh, you know, it's the 11th of these translations, um, and, but that didn't stop. In 1885, there's a revised version. I don't know if that list goes all the way down, but then there's a, um, after the revised version, you get 
the American Standard Version, you get the Revised Standard Version in 1952. By 1971, there's a new American Standard. By 1978, there's a new International Version, the NIV. In 1982, somebody published what they called the New King James Bible. Um, in 1989, a new Revised Standard. In 2001, an English Standard, ESV. Uh, there's been a Holman Christian Standard, a New English Translation, a Modern English Version, and a Christian Standard Bible, and there's others. But a lot of these Bibles, well... For reasons I'm going to tell you, I don't use those to teach. There's some people who say the King James is perfect. I respect people who take that position. I believe it is the version to teach from. And I believe I can defend all of my doctrine from the King James Version. But I go a little bit further. You can take that down. I occasionally will look to the underlying original word as it was in Hebrew or as it was in Greek because I want to better understand a verse. And on occasion, on a rare occasion, I might even look at a modern translation to see if that helps me understand what this is saying. But I still consider the King James Bible to be the final authority and I have four reasons for that. And I, you know, I want to tell you those because someday somebody's going to ask you, why are you using an outdated Bible? I don't believe it's outdated. I still believe it's the best. But one of the reasons, the first reason why we use the King James is because it has, it, the translators used a superior original text. Superior text is the first reason. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And the Jewish people have been called of God to preserve the Old Testament. If you go to Israel, you might get a chance to see a scribe. And a scribe works for months and even years to write out a Bible. Their Bible is what we call the Old Testament. The way they do it is very, very meticulous. If they make an error, they throw, it away, throw the whole thing away. They want to make sure that errors don't creep in to the Bible. If one translator or one scribe makes an error, then another scribe will repeat the same error over and over again. When they get through with a page, they count every line on the page. They count every letter on the page to make sure that the, what they're writing is the exact same writing as the scroll or the book that they were copying. They do this by hand. They're very, very careful. And I believe what the Jewish people use today is what is called the uh, Masoretic, M-A-S-O-R-E-T-I-C, Masoretic text. Uh, Masoretic means to hand down. There were some Masoretes who, who made sure they handed down the Hebrew words correctly. Uh, the Ben Kaya Masoretic text is what was used by the King James translators when they translated the Old Testament into English. Generations of Jewish scribes and scholars had been very, very careful about how they preserved the scriptures. And most Jews and most Protestants consider the Masoretic text to be the authoritative. Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. It, it was written sometime between the 7th and the 10th centuries uh, after Christ, but it was a copy of what had been written before in the 9th century, in the 7th century, in the 5th century, in the 2nd century, in the 1st century BC, carefully copied over and over and over again. And this version, I believe, is very, very um, very accurate. The oldest copy we've got, I think, goes back to about the 10th century. But as I said, it was an accurate copy of manuscripts from centuries before that. Now, there's older versions of the Septuagint, the Greek translation, uh, available. But there's almost no differences 
are only minor differences between the Septuagint version, if you translate it back into Hebrew, and the Masoretic Hebrew text. And when you when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls in the late 1940s and the 1950s, those date back to before Christ. And those proved that the Masoretic text was a reliable Hebrew text. Um, I'm telling you that because that's what the King James translators used when they translated the Old Testament. Um, but if you look at most of those modern English translations, they're not based on the Masoretic text. They're based on other, more modern Hebrew texts. I told you what the King James Version used was the ben, Asher, ben Chaim Masoretic text. But most new translations use a Ben Asher Hebrew text. Now those names may not mean very much to you, but the Ben Asher text has between 20 and 30,000 differences from the Masoretic text. Between 20,000 and 30,000 changes. But the text that Jesus used didn't need thousands of changes. Jesus unreservedly quoted from the Old Testament. He didn't offer any textual criticism. If there would have been corrections needed, Jesus would have made them. Who is Ben Asher and who are the Ben Asher revisers to think that they can change what was written in Hebrew thousands of years ago? I like the King James Version because it's based upon a superior Hebrew text. Instead of looking at what the modern translations say in the Old Testament from an inferior text. The New Testament was also translated from a superior text, a superior Greek text. Uh, it's based upon um, the Textus Receptus, or the traditional text it's called. But nearly all modern translations of the Bible use one of two different Greek texts. A lot of them use the Nestle Aland. Um, Greek New Testament 28th edition. I get a red flag right away. If it needs to be revised 28 times, how accurate can it be? And then there's a, another one. To, um, oh, I'll get to it in a second. But um, the Textus Receptus is the Greek text that was used by Martin Luther when he first translated the Bible into the German tongue. It was used by William Tyndale, by Miles Coverdale, by the translators of the Geneva Bible. And the Textus Receptus was used by the King James translators. Just about every Reformation era New Testament used the Textus Receptus. Now that was a a Greek New Testament that was printed by a Christian in about uh, the first part of the 1500s, 1516, I think, uh, by Desiderius uh, Erasmus. Um, but what he had done was looked at the earlier manuscripts that no longer exist, and he accepted what's called the Byzantine priority. That's not going to make a lot of sense to you, but there's two different Greek versions out there, essentially. One is called the Byzantine priority, and the other is called the Alexandrian priority. The Alexandrian priority is based on some Greek manuscripts that were found in Alexandria, Egypt. The Byzantine was based on some manuscripts that were found in primarily Syria. Um, 
the modern translations like the Greek from Egypt. The King James and the Protestant era, Protestant Reformation era translations use the ones that were found in Syria. Which one is the original? Which one is real? Which one did Paul write? It's hard to know. But we have over 5,000, 5,255 ancient Greek manuscripts dating back to the early church to as early as the, uh, about 120 A.D. And over 90% of the Greek manuscripts we have today follow the Byzantine priority. 90% of the ancient Greek texts use those Syrian Greek. Only a little less than 10% of the ones that exist follow the Egyptian Greek text. So if 90% of the ones that still exist use Byzantine text, why do almost all of the modern translations choose to use the Alexandrian texts? I don't understand that. Maybe the Alexandrian is more right, but I have to go with what I feel. And I feel that 90% of the texts follow the Byzantine priority, and that's what the King James translators use. So I'd rather have a New Testament that's based on 90% of the ancient documents we've got rather than saying, no, I'm going to throw away 90% of it and take the 10%. They point to the Textus Receptus as accurate. Quotations from ancient, what they call church fathers, the Christians who wrote in the 2nd and 3rd and 4th century. The vast, vast majority of those quotations are quoting from the Byzantine, the Syrian texts, the ones that went into the Textus Receptus. But all of these really modern English ones don't use the Textus Receptus. They use the Nestle Alant 28th edition or the Westcott and Horse text. And those deviate from the Textus Receptus in about over 5,600 different places. And while other versions of Hebrew and other versions of Greek have their champions and they'll tell you why they're better, I still cling to the versions that were used by the King James translators. Um, the Masoretic Hebrew and the Textus Receptus Greek. I think it's a reason why this is a better translation because they used better text to begin with. The second reason why I think the King James is better is because I think the translators were better. The men who translated the King James Version were superior translators. They were an extraordinary group of scholars. No modern English translation has ever used such a group of experts to do the actual work of translating from Hebrew and Greek into English. Fifty-seven men were involved in this work. Every one of them was an expert in both all three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. You could hand a Greek book to any one of them, they could read it. They could read the Hebrew. They all knew how to translate into English. They all actually read and approved the English versions that were being prepared, and it took them seven years to do it. Um, they divided into committees, and I'll talk about how they did that later, but I want to tell you that most modern translations are the work of just one scholar. Maybe a committee of four or five people. And most times, it's only one or two people on that committee who actually can read the original Hebrew and Greek. Then they put a few well-known theologians on the committee 
so that they can write an introduction to the new version. They copyright it and sell it. And if you've got a well-known theologian writing the introduction, you can sell it and you get a lot of money. See, I can't, I can't photograph and display the ESV or the NIV version because those are copyrighted. Now, there's probably an exception for churches to use it, but King James Version copyright, if it ever had one, it didn't. But if it ever had, it would have expired centuries ago. People aren't selling the King James Version to, in order to really make money on it. But there's a big profit motive behind the ESV and the NIV and are these other translations. But the translators, as I said, these were, were all bona fide scholars, 57 bona fide scholars working together, reviewing each other's work, criticizing each other, correcting each other, making sure that the final product was the best it possibly could be. So they used superior text. They had superior translators. And they used a superior technique, number three. The way they went about it was, uh, I think, helps to preserve the accuracy of this King James Version. They divided themselves into six companies. They either met in Oxford at the university, at Cambridge at the university, or in Westminster Cathedral or Westminster Abbey. I'm not sure which it was. Um, there was an Old Testament section at Westminster that translated Genesis through 2 Kings. The Old Testament group at Cambridge did uh, First Chronicles through Ecclesiastes. The Old Testament group at Oxford, Isaiah to Malachi. The New Testament section at Westminster and Oxford divided the New Testament up. And then at Cambridge, there was a group that did the Apocrypha, some books that are not part of our Bible, never have been accepted. They translated the Apocrypha into English, not because they felt it was part of the Bible, but they felt that it might have some historical value, so they went ahead and translated those books. But the, as I said, the technique is superior. There's two reasons that it was superior. First, each one of these men had to write out in his own hand a complete copy of the books that were assigned to him. He would have to translate Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all the way through to Second Kings, if that was his assignment. Had to write that out in English, from Hebrew, in his own hand. Then all the persons in that committee, in that section, the 12, 20, however many were in that section, 12 or so, they exchanged what they had written out. And then they looked over each other's work. And they, the whole section had to agree on the final product. <clears throat> then they sent their approved text, English text, to all the other sections, the ones that had done the New Testament or the Apocrypha. And they all looked over the work that was done. And they all had to agree. Finally, two representatives of each of the six sections all met together. They reviewed the final product. And they all had to agree that it was an accurate translation. That's the first reason why I think the technique was superior. That's a whole lot better than just one person going through the whole th Bible. Secondly, they use what's called a verbal equivalence technique. That's a word-for-word -word translation. If they saw a word in Greek, they put it into English. Um, a word in Hebrew, they translated it into an English word. They used the actual words that were inspired of God and translated those words into English. That's called verbal equivalence, word-for-word -word translation. All of the modern versions, I think all, as far as I know, all of the modern versions, they don't use verbal equivalence. 
they use what they call dynamic equivalence. They look at the Hebrew word and they translate it into what they think it means. Um, they want the sense of the original language rather than the actual words. Um, it's a non-literal translation. And when you start non-literal translation, when you don't translate the actual word, but you translate the meaning, well, that's open to debate. Well, I think Moses meant this. I think God meant that. Well, no, I think God meant this. Well, why don't you just translate the actual words? I think those Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek words were inspired of God. And I think they should be translated literally. I think every word of God is vital. Now, I will. I'm going to, I don't know, I hope you're interested in this. I will tell you there is some basis for using a dynamic equivalent sometimes. Because... The, sometimes a word in one language doesn't translate literally very well. If we were to translate an English phrase like, those cars were just inching along. If you translated that into German or French or something, it might come out saying those cars were centimetering along. Because inches would have translated into centimeters. And that's not what we meant at all. Um, if you were to say, in English, a real cowboy. He's a real cowboy. That, in another language, might come out something like, he's an actual part human, part bovine young man. So, in defense of of the concept, I can see where sometimes the actual word might cause you to think a little bit different. But I still feel like there's less room for error when you directly translate the original word that Paul wrote in his letter, rather than allowing some human to try to divine or determine what the word meant. Um, modern translations divine what the word means. Uh, there's sometimes we might have to look at a verse, we might even have to look at the original Greek or Hebrew in order to understand it and interpret it, but it's always been that way. It was that way in Bible times. Let me give you one verse in Nehemiah, the eighth chapter, Nehemiah chapter eight. This is what Ezra did. Uh, Ezra the priest in the book of Nehemiah chapter eight, in verse 8, Ezra is up on a pulpit of wood and he's teaching the people. He opens the word of God. He opens the book. In verse 5, Nehemiah 8 and verse 5, Ezra no opened the book in the sight of all the people, uh, for he was above all the people. And uh, when he opened it, the people stood up and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen with the lifting up of their hands. We do that sometimes, particularly when there's preaching that gets exciting. Somebody will go, amen. Uh, we still do that. We have good biblical basis for that. But get down to verse 8. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Sometimes, if it says our conversation is in heaven, that doesn't mean we're talking up in heaven, that our words bounce around in heaven somewhere. You need somebody to, to give you the sense of that, the interpretation of that. You need a man of God or somebody who understands that that means something different. Uh, it means our citizenship. It's where we belong. It's where our loyalty is. It's where our rights uh, come from. So I really believe that the... King James translators uh, used a superior text, were superior translators, they used a superior technique, and finally, they had a superior theology. 
every translator is affected somewhat by his beliefs about God. All of the King James translators were Trinitarians. So every time they were adding in a pronoun about the Holy Ghost, they'd say he. Instead of it, they put in a personal pronoun because that was their doctrinal bias. But I will tell you that these King James translators really, really tried to avoid overtly inserting their belief system into the translation. You don't really read the Church of England doctrines being read into these scriptures. These were all clergymen in the Church of England, the Anglican Church. It would be the Episcopal Church here in America. But this is not an Episcopal Anglican document. They didn't do that. Um, the way they reviewed each other's work and the word-for-word -word equivalence technique that they used made this less of a problem. But the translators of modern English versions, they're not ministers in the body of Christ. Typically, they're not spirit-filled fundamentalist preachers with an intimate knowledge of Greek and Hebrew. For the most part, they're fairly liberal theologians who can't help but let their core beliefs influence their work. And the more wrong they are in their beliefs, the more wrong their translation is. And so I don't believe the, that we should use those very much. Like I say, I may occasionally read one. I've got some, several translations in English on the shelf in my study. But it could be months between times I will ever pull one off and look at it. I frequently do check the original Hebrew or Greek. And I don't think the King James Version is perfect, but I think it's the better translation of the original scriptures than anything else that we have available. And that's why we base our teachings on the King James Version. Um, now, the King James translators began their work in 1604, and they published in 1611. And if you'll put up that uh, first picture, Brother Zachary, this is a copy of a page. It's kind of small. I don't know that you can... Yeah, that's a little bit better. That's a copy of the page uh, from the original 1611 King James Version. A little bit hard to read. Uh, the first book of Moses. Notice how they spelled book. B-O-O-K-E. Um, and then there's a little description before the creation of the heaven and the earth and all of these things goes through. But it's a little bit hard. The beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form, F-O-R-M-E, and void, V-O-Y-D, and darkness, the all S's look like F's, D-A-R-K-N-E-F-F-E. -F -F -E. And then there's a tiny little word, was, that tiny word, wasn't in the original Hebrews, so the King James translators put it in, but they were honest enough that when they inserted a word that wasn't there, they put it in a small text so that you can recognize that it's not part of the original, that's something they inserted. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, D-E-E-P-E. -E -E. And the Spirit of God moved, M-O-O-V-E-D, looks like M-O-O-U-E-D, upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. They also had what we would call a center column reference, but these are original from the King James translators. They put them off to the sides, uh, reference notes. And you can leave that up for just a little bit, but um, there were some immediate problems right after 1611 because they had some typos and a few things were not translated right, and people noticed it. So Cambridge University issued a revision in 1629, and then in 1638. But there were others that continued for years. Finally, Cambridge University issued a revision in 1760, and still that didn't fix all of the problems or the changes in spellings. So Oxford University issued one in 16, pardon me, in 1769. 
And that's the final revision. That's what we use today as the King James Version, the revision from, from 1769. Some of the things that they did in the 1769 revision is instead of those tiny little words like that word uh, was right there, they put them in the same size font but italicized them. So in many of your Bibles, if you find a word that's in italics, it means the translators are telling you that's not an original word. We put that word in to make more sense. Uh, and so that's now in italics. Um, they would made some minor changes. For example, I'll just, you don't have to look at this, but Matthew 13, 6 originally said and had not sin. But by 1769, they changed it to say had no sin. Um, they fixed a lot of those spelling errors or changes, I guess, in the English so that sins, instead of S-I-N-N-E-S, was changed to S-I-N-S, the way we'd recognize it today. A lot of those spelling changes were made. They capitalized the H in Holy Ghost. Changes, put in some punctuation, things like that. They changed the marginal notes by taking out all the references to the Apocrypha. And they changed some printing errors. Matthew 26, 34 used to say, might, M-I-G-H-T, they changed it to night, N-I-G-H-T, because that's the correct word. And the Oxford Revision became the standard version that all printers subsequently used. However, there are still three differences between an Oxford King James Bible and a Cambridge King James Bible. Does anybody here have a Cambridge? Anybody got a Cambridge Bible? No, not here. Anybody? Oh, yes. Brother, would you mind reading for me Jeremiah 34, 16? Jeremiah 34, 16. Brother Kevin. Did it say he had set? In verse 16 there, every man to his neighbor. Um, no, whom he had set at liberty. I know. Mine says he. The Oxford version, the latest version says he. But the Cambridge version still says, ye have set. That's one of the three differences. Keep your Bible with you. We're going to turn to 2 Chronicles 33. Now, I'm not sure these differences are, you know, you're not going to lose your salvation over any one of them. It's not going to keep you out of heaven or anything. But I just thought it was kind of interesting that three of the corrections that were made didn't go into the Cambridge versions. 2 Chronicles 33 and verse 19. It's just a minor difference. But his prayer also and how God was entreated of him and all his sins with an S on it. But yours doesn't have an S, does it? The Cambridge Bible doesn't have an S on sins. The Oxford Bible does. And the last of these three is probably... A little bit more significant is in the book of Nahum, Nahum the third chapter, after Amos and Obadiah and Jonah, and Micah, there's Nahum right before Habakkuk, um, Nahum chapter 3 and verse 16 says, thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. The canker worm spoileth, and what's the next word, Brother Kevin? Yep. It flieth away or it fleeth away. There's a difference in those words. 
I don't know that those differences are going to matter in, in any great significance, but there is a difference between a Cambridge and an Oxford Bible. Um, the Cambridge publications made every one of the other corrections that were made in 1769 except for these three minor ones. But my point is that I firmly believe that while there may be some minor error somewhere, the King James Version is the very absolute best English translation, and I use it to teach doctrine. I got just one more picture. Can you put it up and make it as big as you can? Uh, the Gospel of St. John. It just doesn't look quite the way it does these days. Um, that introductory, the divinity, D-I-U-I-N-I-T-I-E, humanity, H-U-M-A-N-I-T-I-E, an office of Iusus, Iufus, I-E-F-U-S, Christ is C-H-R-I-F-T. Uh, we don't spell that way anymore. The testimony of John, um, but I think you could read the King James from the original 1611 version and still read it like you do today. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness. And the darkness, might have a little trouble reading darkness, but you can read it comprehended it not. Now behind me on this stand, I have a photocopy, a facsimile of a 1611 King James Bible. You're welcome at your own time to come up and take a look at it. You can see what the original King James looked like, compare it to what we have today. Next to it I have a modern King James Bible, but I'd prefer you not touch it. This was Brother William Souter's Bible, and it's more than 100 years old. And if we start flipping those pages, they're going to tear up, so I'd prefer you not look at that and not put your hands on it. But you're welcome to flip through the 1611 version of the King James Bible. And so when I read modern Christian books and read these translations as they quote scriptures, I think, why have they abandoned the King James Version? And I don't think they know that the King James translators used a superior original text, that they were superior translators, that they had a superior technique, and they had, did a superior job at keeping their theology out of their final product. Um, but I think they did, and therefore, while this may not be perfect, I don't think any of us have to be a Hebrew scholar or a Greek scholar in order to be saved. I don't think you need to be an ancient language scholar in order to go on to perfection, be a part of the bride of Jesus Christ. I really think this word has been preserved unto our generation, just like the Bible said. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my pathway. The scripture says, in the 119th Psalm. And also in that Psalm it says, the entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. Uh, this truth is sufficient truth. There may be an error or two somewhere and some wise scholar may be able to point out to me a place where another translation might be better in one particular word or one particular verse. And that may well be, but when you look at the entirety of the text, when you look at the entirety of the book, this is a valid book. Uh, I don't want, I mean, if you want to read the, the New English Translation or the Living Bible, the Amplified Bible, to understand it a little bit, please feel free to do so. But don't stand up and teach doctrine out of that because doctrine is going to have to be based on an accurate translation, and this is the most accurate one I can find. Again, if I was in Paris as a French person, I would be looking for the most accurate French version of the Bible I can find. Uh, I can't do that now because I know nothing about the French language. I cannot speak Jean Papa Francais. That means I don't speak French. Jean Papa Francais. Uh, no habla espanol. I can't speak Spanish. Uh, I, I don't speak German. Sprechen Sie Deutsch? 
No, nine. Nine. I don't. Nine. I can't speak Hindi. I can barely speak English at times. Sometimes I feel like I've just washed my tongue and can't do a thing with it. But I have studied a little bit into why we use the King James Bible. And if you walk into just almost any other church in this city, now there's a few, but I bet you 90%, 95% of the churches in this city, to the extent that they quote any scriptures at all, are going to quote them out of something other than the King James Version. But it's not outdated. It's not superseded. It is the best that we've got. And it contains, it's preserved enough truth in this for us to fulfill the requirements of God in our life and to fulfill the mission that God has given this church. I wanted to tell you that. I wanted to explain why we used it. But I also wanted to make sure you understand why there are times that I will go back and give you well, the underlying Greek word is, uh, yeah, you can take that off. The underlying Greek word is, is this, where it says word, the word was God, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The underlying Greek word is logos. And logos has a deeper meaning than just a written or spoken word. It involves wisdom, it involves creation, it involves perfection. Sometimes it's good to do that, and I will do that. Um, because I want to be able to give the sense thereof, just like Ezra did when he read the word distinctly. We'll go back to the word. Uh, it says in the eighth chapter of the book of Isaiah, I don't remember the verse, but I think it's the eighth chapter, it says, uh, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no life in them. I think it's verse 20 that says that. And that's that's what we're looking for, the law and the testimony. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Some of the ancient Greek translations in 1 John 5 that talk about there's three that bear witness in heaven uh, do not include that. I don't know how many of the 5,255 Trans, or Greek texts actually have that, but I do know that some of them do not. And I believe it's the Alexandrian ones that do not have that language. But I'd have to go back and look at that. But there are times where there are differences between those ancient Greek texts. And some of it got put into the King James Version and some didn't. And that's why, again, there's times that I think it's worthwhile to go back and look at the original language so that we can give the sense thereof. Amen? Good. All right, so right now we want to give in the offering. I think every translation of the Bible encourages you to be a charitable giver. Uh, the original tongue does, the translations do. In German, in French, in Hindi, they all encourage us that God does love a cheerful giver and it's the right thing to do to give your tithes and give offerings and support the work of the Lord and there's so much that we have. Uh, I'll just mention a, um, as an announcement that, that a week from Monday I think will be Labor Day and we will have a potluck picnic here on the church grounds uh, with a meal at 1 o'clock. One o'clock on next coming Monday, potluck uh, picnic. I wish I could be here, but I'll still be in the meeting at the convention center in Louisville. But I know everyone here will have a good time. So right now, why don't we receive a good offering for the work of the Lord. Ask our band to give us a song and our ushers to come forward and serve us by receiving this offering for the Lord. Yeah.